faculty members and all the participants. I am Amita Parate and I am Shilly Saxena. Welcome you all in NIT Delhi to today's public lecture on India's own Aditya Elwal Mission by Professor Dr. Deepankar Banerjee. Now I request Professor Manit Manoj Kumar to felicitate our guest speaker Dr. Deepankar Banerjee. Thank you, sir. Professor Dipankar Banerjee is currently the director of the Aryabhata Research Institute of Observational Sciences, Aries Nainital. He is an astrophysicist with a bachelor's degree in physics from Xavier's College, Kolkata, and master's degree in theoretical physics from the University of Kolkata. He has obtained his PhD from Indian Institute of Astrophysics and completed two postdoctoral tenures in reputed institutions of Europe. He is also a senior professor at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Dr. Venerji's area of interest is the sun and the solar atmosphere. His work involves theoretical and numerical modeling using data from ground and space-based instruments. His work has enriched our understanding of the sun and impact on space weather. He is the co-chair of the science working group of the Aditya mission. Aditya is the first dedicated Indian mission to study the sun, launched by ISRO on 2nd September 2023. He is also involved with NASA's PUNCH mission. He is fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and National Science Academy, and currently the president of the Astronomical Society of India. Dr. Benerji, has more than 140 peer-reviewed publications with around 3,300 citations in international journals. He is currently supervising five PhD students, while 15 of his students have completed their PhDs. Apart from his scientific career, Dr. Banerjee has deep interest in various other activities. He is trained in Hindustani vocal and part of a Bengali theater group and regularly performs in plays, participating in national and international theater festivals. Dr. Banerjee's love for science and zest for life are truly infectious. Now, I invite Dr. Dibangal Banerjee to address the gathering and deliver the public lecture. We welcome you, sir. Very big, so maybe it is difficult to see from a distance. So, as much possible, you can come to control. Thank you. 
someone has to tell me how much I am doing with the time. So, Gopal, after maybe five, ten or something, you can word me. Okay. So, yes. Good evening. It's a pleasure for me to be here, uh, and thanks for coming. It's a little odd hour probably, and some of the students are probably also heading home soon after the holidays. So, um, since we are going to start a five-day uh, workshop from tomorrow, actually it's a school, not, uh, but in more in the form of a workshop because when we uh, want to have these kind of training schools, we want. You know more interaction with the students so maybe some of the students have already arrived so uh, this is more of a you know popular level uh, i'm going to talk today just to excite you about uh, uh, the opportunities what we have in india and also since i'm in nig you could see that probably i've added uh, some uh, some more additional words here i will talk about very briefly about ai i know uh, most of the younger generation are interested in uh, doing uh, in this domain of AIML and with this current astronomy missions opportunities are really really a lot we have already worked on this for last 10 years probably we were not using the board in its uh, proper way but we were doing automation in our astronomical data for for a more than a decade and I will show some examples of that and I will talk about briefly uh, you know what the opportunities exist in the near future here I am from, on behalf of a very, very large group of uh, people who have been behind this mission. You can imagine the mission of this class, uh, you know, includes uh, scientists, engineers, and people from different levels. There are lots of logos in the, uh, in the bottom of this slide you can see. So there are many institutions who are, uh, you know, involved uh, in this mission, some mostly in the form of a hardware. In, the, in terms of building these instruments, some are in the science operations and so on. And I'm here on behalf of the science uh, working group, which will be responsible for the operations also. But also, we were involved more than a decade to define what instrument we want to have on space and so on. So, uh, without giving any particular name, I would say that this is a fully, uh, you know, complete uh, Atman in Bhar Bharat and Make in India project because all the payload instruments what we talk about are built in India in different academic institutions that is through labs. So I think it's a it's a big step forward for us. So what I propose to do today is I will uh, give a brief about why do we need to study sun very briefly. I can spend a full week probably. Uh, just on that subject, because we have been spending our last three decades of uh, our life already on that. And then I will talk about what is this mission about and uh, what is it expected and so on. So the sun is our nearest star, uh, but it shows different scales of variability. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, you see sudden explosions uh, happening in the atmosphere of the sun. Incidentally, this is an image taken from one of the uh, observatories uh, from NASA called Solar Dynamic Observatory. And it is looking at the atmosphere of the sun, namely the corona of the sun. And you see there are certain regions of the sun, there are more emissions, they are brighter, they're called active regions. And now we know that underneath these active regions, there is a presence of strong magnetic field. So it is essentially the magnetic field, it's a variability, like whether it is there or not. And if it is there, then how it is changing dictates all the dynamics what happens in the solar atmosphere or even in the interior to some extent. So it is important to understand the, the nature of the magnetic field, its structure, where it is coming, why it is coming, and how it is changing. So these, uh, you know, kind of variability are on the order of few seconds to minutes to hours and so on. But I will also show 
you that these variability of presence or absence of magnetic field in the sun is there for several years to centuries. And presence or absence of this magnetic field of large scale uh, time variability has a lot of impact on our climate. Today, you know, our existence is here because of the presence of the sun at an appropriate distance away. If sun is uh, not there for many uh, days and all that, we will not exist here, as simple as that. So, the total radiation which comes out of the sun is considered to be constant. We will see whether it is really a constant or not. And if it does change, what is going to be effect on our uh, you know, climate is another subject area. So, monitoring the sun on different time scales is very, very important. And that monitoring, if it happens from the space platform, it is even more preferred. So, I will showcase that. And the other uh, thing is, you know, sun is our ideal laboratory for various branches of physics. Since I came from completely physics background, you know, whether you name it, you know, uh, atomic physics, nuclear physics, particle physics, plasma physics, you know, your theory can be verified by looking at observations from the sun. Because those uh, conditions, what is there in the sun, for example, millions of Kelvin of temperature, several thousands of, you know, kilogauss of uh, magnetic field, that kind of environment or conditions is not achievable almost in a laboratory environment. So, you see, physics remains as a hypothesis until it is verified. In general, science is like that. You know, you have to have an experimental verification of your of your new theory. So, that way, astrophysics provides us a real opportunity to verify various branches of physics. And you hear about other astronomical context also. I will not go into that. But, sun itself, since it is close to us, we can really see much more details on the sun. Because most of the other astrophysical objects are, you know, studied as a point object. So, we don't get to, you know, uh, know such details what is possible for the sun. So, that way, sun also provides the ideal laboratory for physics. So, as I indicated, these objects, which show strong presence of magnetic field, they often, not often, almost 100%, uh, they appear as bipoles. Magnetic field always comes in pairs. You have to have monopole doesn't exist, you know. So here, what is shown here is the location of magnetic field concentrations on the solar surface. This is called magnetogram. And if I zoom over one particular magnetic field, we have actually much more details of this. And this is quite amazing. There are, you know, really, really very big telescopes which allows us to study these magnetic structures and its evolution in much greater detail. And of course, these observations started from, you know, I'm not putting it here. Maybe the, some, uh, ah, he's testing the cordless microphone. Anyway, so, this, uh, you know, sunspot observation, direct observations of the sunspot, these magnetic regions, probably, you know, the other gentleman is trying to test the uh, polar mic. Okay, so that uh, star observation started after the discovery of the telescope, which is about 1600, and of course, Galileo Galilei also required a bit of observations of the sun. Now, as I mentioned, if I know now, uh, what is plotted here is the yearly sunspot number for last 400 years. What you see here, there it seems to be a, a period over which the sunspot number is quite high, and there are periods over which the sunspot number is very low. So these periods where sunspot number is very large, we call it solar maxima, and when these uh, you know uh, period over which the, there are hardly any sunspots, they call it solar minima. So obviously, you can straight away see that when the sun is very active magnetically, means there are lots of sunspots, you know, all these huge dynamic uh, things which happens in the solar atmosphere, mainly the flares and CMEs, which I will, uh, I will dwell with a little later, uh, possibilities are, are more. So here, what you see here is, this alteration typically have a periodicity of about 11 years, it's not strictly always 11, but also you notice that the amplitude of these, uh, you know, uh, these oscillations, what you see, are also varying. Sometimes in the last 100 years, recorded, I see that around 1957, 1950s, 
You know, that cycle was very, very strong. Cycle 19, we call it. Thankfully, that time the space technology was still not there. Probably, if it would have been there, we would have lost thousands of satellites. Because the sun was so active, it was, you know, emitting not many, uh, you know, all these fuel explosions. Today, thankfully, again, in some sense, the sun is less active. Uh, but again, what is the impact of this less activity? We have to study that. What happened way back in 1650 to 1700, uh, if we go back to the uh, sunspot records, there were periods, hardly there were any sunspots for almost 50 years. What was the effect? The Volga River, which is in, uh, you know, runs into Europe, was frozen for 40 years. It was extremely cold in Europe. Several thousands of people died. So obviously there is a direct, so these are called mini ice ages. If I now, you know, go back to the other proxy data of sunspots or magnetic activity of the sun, people have done that exercise for several thousands of years and they've discovered 22 to 23 such mini ice ages. So there obviously would have been very, very big impact of mini ice ages on our civilization. So we probably will not be able to afford such mini ice ages in, in our future or near future. Obviously, it will come sometime. Uh, there is also a prediction that lots of work happens when such a, whether there is a possibility of having a mini ice age kind of situation. So it is very, very important to understand the magnetic, you know, activity of the sun. So that's the general, uh, you know, big question, so to say, for solar physics. One is the short term variability, all these big explosions which happens in the time scales of minutes to hours and that impacts our daily life. And the other impact is long term impact it can really, really change our climate completely. So both this uh, you know, side of the story uh, of sun's importance is there. Here what I'm showing is again, this image is taken from a satellite called SOHO. Uh, this is a solar and heliospheric observatory. This is again at Lagrange and one around the event in one point. This is one of the first, you know, solar mission launched in 1995. And actually, incidentally, uh, you know, we started working with the SOHO mission data from 97, just a few months after Robert was, uh, also started, uh, you know, with the SOHO data uh, from Europe. So this was a European Space Agency mission. And we started looking at the total solar radiation because, you know, total solar radiation, what is plotted here is this one is the solar radiation, we call it irradiance. It only varies by 0.1%. That has a very good correlation with the sunspot number. Again, the sunspot number is direct indicator of the magnetic field variability on the sun. So now we realize that there, whether the total radiation from the sun uh, you know, will be changing or not, will be totally depend on not the magnetic activity of the sun. So if we can understand the magnetic variability, then we will be able to probably understand the total solar radiance as well. Now also there is one more important element now which is going to be addressed in future is it just not the total solar radiance which is important, but if you look at the flux in certain wavelength band, that has more impact on our climate. So that's one of the reasons we have actually launched uh, in Aditya a near UV, you know, uh, uh, flux uh, determination, uh, uh, you know, possibility, which will look at the near UV radiations in certain wavelength band, and it is theoretically predicted that that radiation can be as large as 20 percent. The total intensity is only varying by 0.1, but people have not looked at individual because near UV is affecting our ozone layer formations and all that much more than other radiation. Uh, so there are a lot more intricate, uh, you know, things which we have to understand about the long-term variability. So it is important to have a continuous monitoring. So that's why this Aditya mission will allow us to do this. Of course, these kind of huge explosions happens in the sun. They're called um, magnetic uh, storms. And uh, these huge ejecta, when it travels to interplanetary space, you can imagine, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, situation will be in the interplanetary environment. For comparison, the size of the Earth is shown here. So you can imagine how much material is confined in this magnetic structure. So this magnetic structure, you know, after certain, you know, time because of certain instability and, and so on, so whatever material was confined within this structure is thrown into the planetary space. So what happens when these structures are thrown into the planetary space? These are called coronal mass ejection. 
and those coronal mass ejections travel through interplanetary space. And if you are in the interplanetary space somewhere, you will be directly impacted by that, you know, big huge explosion. Now, how do we track these explosions? What we do is we create an artificial, uh, you know, eclipse. Incidentally, the solar corona, normally when we look at the sky, we only see the surface of the sun. That is called the photosphere. And the brightness of the photosphere is very, very high. The atmosphere of the sun, the outer atmosphere of the sun is called corona, whose emission is only one millionth time the brightness of the solar disk. So we can't see that, you know, weak emission in normal circumstances. When we can see corona? During total solar eclipse. Because total solar eclipse is a perfect natural phenomena where moon very nicely blocks the solar disk and during the totality phase, if you are on the totality path, you will be able to see the coronal emission. So in the past, people have been traveled all across the globe and uh, I was also one of them, probably thankfully, I've traveled in China, Twister Islands, so, you know, you can, uh, I can include a few more names, even with the Russian aircraft. Uh, from uh, uh, from Agra, you flew out in 32 in 95. So uh, that's fantastic experience, but you know it's only for a few minutes you can observe Corona. So that's not ideal. So artificially from space, we block the solar disk by this instrument called Corona graph, and that allows you to image the outer Corona. So here there are actually two Corona graph images superimposed on one another to monitor these coronal mass ejections as it moves away from the sun. Of course, modern day we have even more powerful instruments on board Parker Solar Probe. Parker Solar Probe incidentally is uh, really, really traveling much, much closer to the sun. We can't even imagine how this kind of mission. But they are going so close that they can't even look at the sun. They look good, just looking away from the sun and trying to see these coronal mass ejections. So I'm sure the, you won't, don't want to be in this kind of environment. Nobody will be really uh, surviving in this kind of environment. So what is the impact of these kind of coronal mass ejections? This is what is formally uh, recorded. 13th March 89, there were power power blackouts in North America, particularly in Canada. They were, uh, I was told that, you know, the metro uh, was stopped for four hours. And then, you know, it's a very, uh, in a cold place in March. So people were frozen because they had power blackouts. Of course, it happens in India or in Kolkata quite often. But uh, they don't suffer that much as the Western world. So the insurance companies have paid some few billion dollars as a compensation for this. So this is actually really becoming a big, you know, thing for, for the industry. So that's only one example. Of course, there were other examples, uh, you know, uh, rich people like Mr. X. He uh, prefers, uh, uh, you know, new businesses and uh, he has a company called uh, SpaceX. He launched 40 satellites uh, just a year back and all the satellites were lost. There was a solar storm and uh, they were warning, but he ignored that. It is not that the storm directly hit his satellite, but because of the presence of the, uh, you know, the storm, Within the interplanetary medium, there are a lot of other thing, changes happen. See, when a satellite moves in the uh, you know, space, it also experiences drag force. So the drag force will not be the same in, you know, in normal conditions and when a solar storm is traveling through the interplanetary space. He didn't calculate that. So none of the satellites could reach the designated orbit. So they were supposed to go say 400, 500 kilometers and all that. But the drag force was much stronger than what was in normal quiet conditions so were calculated. So all the 40 satellites were lost. So, I mean, he lost all the satellites. Of course, Mr. Briggs can afford probably. But now uh, he has realized that, you know, he can't ignore, uh, you know, everything. So maybe, you know, we will get some funding from Mr. X also for, uh, you know, providing some information for when it is safe to launch. So this is actually a very, very important area that we have to do, you know, prediction. We call it space weather. It's like, you know, uh, if you want to, I remember when we were kids, uh, if you travel to the coastal areas and all that, the, those times the, the fishermen used to hear the news item in the morning. Is it safe to go to, for fishing in the sea? 
So now it's the space agencies, they call us, is it, uh, is it safe to launch uh, the satellite? So it is because the, it's a launch itself is dangerous and of course, you know, there are so many satellites get directly impacted by these storms, which I will come to that. So this, uh, this, uh, you know, the disturbances which come from the sun, thankfully, it directly doesn't impact us because Earth also has its magnetic field. If Earth would not have its magnetic field, then our existence would not have been here. So for any planet to have a life or not, in fact, this is in the context of even extrasolar planet, there are about 5,000 planets discovered in other systems. We call it extrasolar planets. The conditions of life is one is presence of magnetic field on that planet. Because that planet actually, I mean, the Earth, a magnetic field provides a you know, cocoon, and that protects the energetic particles to come, you know, not directly uh, through this. Essentially, what happens, this is a disturbed magnetic field lines profile shown because of the presence of all these, you know, things which is coming from the sun. There is also a continuous, you know, uh, flow of material which comes from the sun, which is called uh, solar wind. And that disturbs this entire magnetic field structure. Of course, the you know, um, as I said, these charged particles cannot directly cross this magnetic field lines, but they will guide it along magnetic field lines and they will try to you know enter through the polar regions. That's how you see a beautiful for auroras and so on. I will show you pictures. In fact, when such a huge storm comes, this is an image taken by again Soho satellite. So you see how the detector is flooded with cosmic ray hits. And if there is a you know space uh, you know person going for uh, a walk or something, of course uh, uh, there is a prediction that uh, people uh, again rich people like Mr. X uh, will do some uh, space uh, tourism. This is again another area, but space tourism will not be safe when such conditions are there in space. So you have to be predicting. What is it safe to go for space tourism as well? If you want to go to other planets and so on as well, it's very important. This is uh, the picture taken from during the auroras. Of course, this is mostly seen from more uh, from the higher, uh, you know, uh, longitude uh, latitude, typically from either in Alaska or you know uh, in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, I haven't seen it with my own eyes. But uh, some of my students send me pictures now. And uh, essentially, this is the interaction of the charged particles with the, with, the, uh, with the molecules in the Earth's atmosphere. So there is an oxygen and other you know, uh, ionization happens. So there is a change in color. So there is again a completely different ball game altogether. So, so this entire field is called the space weather. It does affect global technologies. We are so much dependent on the on the atmosphere because, as you know, all our telecommunications are directly related with the where the atmosphere is. So, if there are disturbances which affect the atmosphere, it will affect our communications also. If you are watching the Indian Idol, uh, the TV program may, may get interrupted, or your uh, WhatsApp messages may not be delivered. Uh, because of the satellite communication and it is indeed that so many satellites get damaged by solar storm. We don't know because it doesn't come to the public domain. So that's why the space uh, industry is very much interested now on this particular subject of space weather prediction. Newer companies are coming up. Of course, uh, GPS uh, are very, very important for many, many different things. There are, you know, even the oil drilling and all that happens that needs perfect uh, GPS uh, coordinate uh, you know, uh, references which gets affected. The power grid I indicated already because these charged particles they they interact with the power grid induced, you know, uh, currents are generated. So you get a transformers uh, blackouts and so on. It may not be so much directly impacting uh, a country like India, but we, our space is getting much more uh, important. So there are lots of uh, areas where, you know, uh, as I indicated, the bold ones are for. For the Indian context, the particular power grids and oil pipelines are not so much directly impacting us. But in general, it does affect global technologies, uh, the space weather. I will get into uh, our mission. The Aditya, what is plotted here is the solar cycle. 
we started all these discussions way back in 2016 and we were expected to have a small satellite program with a one coronagraph in a low earth orbit and low earth orbit is typically you know 400 500 kilometers with one instrument a coronagraph with the imaging capability we uh, started working on it then isro uh, approved uh, the project funding was given it was an imaging coronagraph 2009 we started building it started you know uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, work but then around 2013 this is us just after our successful mangalayan mission mars mission uh, isro became more adventurous and uh, professor yuva rao was uh, the you know chairman of the advisory committee of space research he called uh, some of us and he was saying you know uh, why are you taking baby steps you know i mean we want to go somewhere else i said somewhere else means one i mean we had no clue that you know uh, and then he said what about l1 i mean we were actually not believing our own ears that you know we could reach l1 because l1 is a quite a bit of distance we are talking about 500 kilometers 600 kilometers and this is 1.5 million kilometers so do we have capability to go to Lagrange? So that you don't have to worry about. So Professor, you are asking thing is you know, that you don't have to worry about. Would you be interested? I said, of course. <laughs> but then uh, as it happens, the scientists, we are always greedy, said that if you are going in like, uh, Lagrange at one point, we can't take this small little phenomenon. We should have much more. I said, okay. So there was an announcement of opportunity given. Uh, as it happens within uh, Two months you have to submit uh, proposals with all payloads. There were many proposals from different institutions. Seven payloads were uh, were selected. Of course, the coronagraph was earlier just with the imaging capability. We made it a big elephant. It was a small one. Uh, we included uh, spectropolarimetric, spectroscopic capabilities. So from 100 kgs, it became a 180 kg payload. And there were other payloads which were accepted and all that. It was expanded. Of course, it took uh, quite a while. Of course, we had COVID challenges as well because this is the time when we were supposed to deliver all the payloads, but you know, none of the labs were functioning. So eventually, we did deliver the payloads in early uh, this uh, year. But that's again amazing feat of uh, ISRO. Uh, you know, they could manage to assemble all this to hundreds of different kind of tests and eventually the launch was second September. We actually could never even expect it after, you know, so much of involvement with Chandrayaan that within few weeks they will be able to take up such a big mission uh, launch. But it all happened uh, and we are on the way. Uh, so a series of, uh, you know, sequences I put it in the, in the movie. I was fortunate to be there inside. Very tense in the first row when the launch sequence were announced. There were thousands of people outside uh, from the gallery. There were sequence of things. It's almost a one hour, you know. And this is the first time. In fact, after one hour only, the chairman came out in the public, uh, the national TV, and then it was said that you know we had a successful launch because each step has its own challenges, uh, and uh, the separation took almost an uh, hour. Uh, this is the launch uh, thing. I often tell this uh, story. I couldn't leave the seat because a lot of uh, my colleagues they they went out to the balcony to see this uh, you know boom going out and all that. But I said you know it's like a cricket match you know you don't change your seat you know, as long as you are in the same seat. The things are going all right. So <laughs> so I was uh, of that opinion and I did stuck to my chair and uh, it all went well. Very briefly, uh, there are five Lagrange points uh, for a two-body system. Essentially, what happens is if it's a third body like a satellite, you you put it in a space, then Lagrange 1 is a location on the Sun-Earth line where if you want to orbit around that point, the centripetal force what you need is uh, being provided by the balance between the force between the satellite and the Earth and the force between satellite and the sun. Sun is of course very massive, 99% almost uh, you know, mass of the solar system is in the sun. So we are almost 99% distance away from the sun. 
the advantage of once you reach Lagrange one point, you need very little fuel to stay in this orbit. It's a big hello orbit. I will show you also some more uh, simulations on that. And you have a view of the sun continuous. So that's the main advantage for solar physics uh, to, to go to Lagrange 1 to have a continuous observation of the sun. Along with that, anything coming from the sun before it reaches Earth, it has to pass through that location. So that means you have a possibility of in-situ observation. So it's a combination of remote sensing and in-situ makes the Lagrange 1 point a perfect vantage point for solar observation. So there are other satellites also in that. How we went there, so we were discussing uh, earlier. So this is a slingshot, uh, you know, uh, thing. Uh, we are comparing, we, this is again, to some extent, ingenuity of ISRO. See, Americans do not do it. They have bigger launch, they just directly go. But that means bigger launch vehicle, bigger fuel and so on and so forth. Boom, they, they travel straight. But uh, we do like this, and then after sort of fifth the orbit, uh, we, leave, uh, we left around 22nd of September, this arc, the centric orbit. Interesting thing is, we were not supposed to, really, originally it was not planned. The institute instruments were turned on during this transit. So we have data as we left the Earth's orbit as well. Because, you know, these are change, uh, you know, circum, I mean, positions. Because initially you are within the Earth's magnetosphere. You have the Earth's magnetic field environment within that. But as you leave Earth's magnetic field environment, what are the changes happens and all that? So there is already data in that, and this is called the cruise phase, and uh, this is called the insertion. We are already pretty close to there. I can't specify precisely where we are, but uh, we are expected to formally uh, have the insertion on between fifth to seventh of January. That's a precise uh, insertion. Means you know the stable orbit around the Lagrange uh, one. But we are already there and we have started observation. I will show some data also on that. So this is what I mean, the first uh, flux which was uh, taken from uh, one of the uh, steps is one of the in-situ instruments on September 12, as early as September 10, uh, you know, these observations were taken. This is what is Lagrange 1 uh, orbit. This is uh, taken from NASA again. There are three other satellites which is uh, actually around Lagrange for one uh, making this uh, you know uh, journey when s and soho soho has a combination of remote sensing and in situ uh, when and s primarily has more particle detectors and magnetometer so we're going to work together with them uh, i had some videos to
Okay. So uh, Aditya is a multi payload observatory class mission. There is another important element which one should also highlight that today modern day astronomy is done with a multi wavelength. Means you know you see a uh, shorter wavelength like UV, X rays, and then infrared, you know, visible. As many wavelengths you can cover, you see the plasma properties from different parts of that particular astrophysical object. And sun is, of course, uh, the closest and the best uh, example of that. So here you see the uh, the biggest, uh, you know, payload, the corona graph at the top there. And next is, uh, you know, the suit instrument, which is called Solar Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope built in Ayuka with the near UV building. So it's a combination of four remote sensing, uh, the corona graph and the near UV imager, two X-ray spectrometers. Uh, called uh, Solex and Helios, they are going to look at the flares, these are the big explosions as well as I was talking about, looking at smaller flares and very big flares. So with the same instrument, it is very hard to really uh, see all these different flares, that's why there are different uh, different components at it, and the in situ instruments are there as you have seen this list. So what we normally look at the in situ instruments, uh, you know, these are uh, highlighted here, in, uh, aspects which is built in uh, Andabal. Uh, and this magnetometer is like a boom here, uh, which is folded now inside. And then as we uh, reach a Lagrange in you know stable orbit, then this boom will be uh, opened up and then we will see it. What do we expect from you know these different instru instruments? When such a huge uh, you know CME comes from the sun, a CME is like a big magnetic flux rope, you know, it's like a rope with a magnetic confined plasma and uh, there are different components and in the, in the front you have sometimes the shock because it again travels in the interplanetary medium. So the signatures what you can see is, you know, you can have a sort of spike in the magnetic field, intrinsic field, you can have a spike in velocities, in the number densities, the temperature, GST is a parameter which is Earth's magnetic field measurement. So when you when you capture such a, you know spice, you can say that you know uh, it probably you know a CAB has uh, passed through the satellite. There are also other magnetic uh, structures which can be or or wind flow patterns which can be here. So here is there is an example we call it a co rotating interactive region. If such kind of uh, ejecta comes, then the signatures are very different. Why I'm showing this is you know. This is at the day for all automation. We are not going to look at every event and all this data which is continuously coming. So if you have automation, if you have machine which is already learned that it can identify between this feature and that feature and also the magnitude, how strong this feature is, you have the warning, right? So if you have to have space weather warning uh, centers, you have to have sophisticated models which will be able to theoretically predict and just to be verified or validated by observations, which is directly capturing also that event. And all these has to be very fast because you only have few hours to predict. So machine has to be really, really trained with earlier observations and then only you can predict that. You know, you know, I mean, you have to train your machine to uh, do this. So there are some data available. So some of the scientific objectives are again. India's first mission to study sun is expected to provide deeper understanding of coronal heating and solar wind acceleration, coupling and dynamics of the solar atmosphere, solar wind distribution and temperature and sonotropy, and initiation of coronal mass ejections, flares, and near-Earth space weather. The Aditya N1 mission has various uniqueness. The mission will provide for the first time spatially resolved solar disk in near UV band and observe CME dynamics very close to the solar disk. The mission will have onboard intelligence to detect CMEs and solar flares and provide directional and energy anisotropy of solar wind. The Aditya N1 mission is unique in its capabilities. The mission proves the dynamics of the coronal mass ejection close to the solar disk, which provides information on the acceleration regime of the 
in this box in your shopping. The mission also captures the information on the energy distribution, flux, and dimensionality of the solar wind. This also enables getting early information on the space weather events. So the other important thing I like to point out is that now the sun is not studied in isolation because it's a very you know composite solar system study we call it heliophysics science because any radiation which is coming from uh, you know sun eventually it is actually traveling through other planets also so in principle you can have probes in other planets so we are already started thinking of putting other uh, you know in situ measurements in other uh, locations we are planning to go to of course moon there is a already, uh, you know, uh, talk about Mars, we already have traveled. Uh, uh, probably we will go to, you know, Venus as well in the near future. So you can see it, how these things impact. So when these are simulations, but clearly shows that when such a, uh, you know, huge ejector comes out of the sun, it's actually impacting other planets and near Earth environment as well. Because everything is not coming towards Earth. It's a 3D space after all. So, if you want to do really a proper space weather study and then what is impacting where, which vantage locations and all that, you have to do this kind of, you know, heliospheric science. And for that, of course, the Western world has uh, filled the space with, these are all missions, you know, these are all satellites or heliospheric, you know, systems observatory. So, these are observatory in space. We have started a bit late, but nonetheless, uh, we are we are sitting in a very good vantage point and probably I must also point out that we have started with a bang because L1 mission is, is not a small mission. So we are so fortunate to have a, you know, catching up with the international community uh, space exploration with a bang. So uh, there is a lot of potential uh, and this shows, you know, the we are probably trying to catch up also with what uh, you know the Western world has done, but uh, we are catching up well with a very pretty you know nice mission. Very few words about AI. In terms of the sun, if I look at the daily image, sorry, this poster uh, probably I should have. I mean, I will have it uh, later on somewhere. In sun, uh, you have many different features. So these are the big you know uh, you know coronal mass ejection kind of things, which is highlighted here. These are regions called coronal hole. It appears that the temperature is lower in those regions and those are the regions where the solar wind, which is a continuous expansion of the you know, solar outer atmosphere, that is faster. So these are, these are theories. But now from, I just mentioned two the, the different regions, so there are n number of different features on the sun which has n number of different, you know, properties and n number of different applications. Now, we need to identify all of them through machine. You know, earlier days, we were only studying one object at a time and studying its properties. But now, you have to see things statistically and how they behave. We want to do prediction means you have to study, you know, thousands of such uh, uh, guys and then really find out what are their properties, commonality, so that you can do prediction. Because no two are identical, they are all different. So you have to find out the statistics, you have to train the machine, you need automation. And uh, this is the, you know, um, real, real uh, you know, era for uh, AI. As I indicated, this is a solar cycle for last, uh, you know, almost 100 years. So the predictions are something like this, so there are different models. I did not talk about these magnetic regions on the sun. They uh, also appear on the surface of the sun at very specific point at specific time. It's not random. They have a pattern. This is called a butterfly diagram. For last 100 years, so this is even more than 100 years, pattern is shown. The sunspots appear in certain high latitude, 35 degree, 40 degree. With the progression of the solar cycle, they go appear more closer to the equator. So this is northern hemisphere, this is southern hemisphere. Both shows this pattern and it is repeated with the magnetic cycle. So this magnetic cycle or solar cycle also shows this you know behavior where these sunspots will come, and that has a lot of implication where these you know CMEs are going, where those storms are likely to come, and all that. Depending on where it is happening on the sun, 
the directional eddy, whether it is going to come towards the earth or not, is also going to be dictated. So we need to monitor all that, but that means again lots of data. I will again show one example. This is one of our work, uh, one of my students' work. We have from Kodai Canal, you know, more than 100 years of data. This data are hand drawn. People have taken uh, observation and they have projected those images on graph paper. And by hand, they have drawn. This is sunspot, this is uh, filament, this is plot. These are all different features on sun. Now we have digitized all that. I need to identify those features, their properties. I can't do it manually, right? I have 30 terabytes of data. So these are all done through, you know, clustering techniques and all that. So there are lots of uh, CNN and other techniques which we are applying to identify those, uh, you know, features and their properties. That will give me insight about the solar cycle for more than 100 years. So this is a one of the probably golden, uh, you know, uh, uh, data source. Of course, Coregional Observatory was built by the Britishers. Uh, it was not uh, probably a good idea to have an observatory in England. They realized that, so they put it in the Kurei Canal <laughs> and started observing. And after they left, we have uh, followed this uh, legacy. And this is one of the richest, you know, archival data. Archival data were thrown away 10, 20 years back. Who is going to look at those images and all that? But they are, you know, gold mine. And it has been only possible through automation. Physically, it is not possible to, I mean, if you do manually or by eye estimation, you will make mistakes. There will be human bias on those observations. But machine is expected to be consistent. Even if it does some errors, you can estimate the error. So now only it is becoming possible. This is the first image from Sud Instrument. It was opened up last week. Uh, the satellite is stable. The images are quite uh, quite nice, and uh, there are near UV images. I will show probably tomorrow a better image when we start the workshop or the school. But what I'm trying to highlight here is there are again different features you see. You see sunspots, you see filaments, you see you know flares from the suit images. So this is the time we need manpower to look at our own data and do this uh, AI applications. There are uh, people who are looking at it, but newer techniques, sophisticated techniques can be applied to it. And comparing with the 1937 image which we have digitized, and this is our work uh, of these areas are called plages. And now we have possibilities of same images, same wavelength images are there in suit. So the point is, uh, I am showing this, this is a monitoring of the sun from 1904, we started observation from Kodaikana 1904. Now we have a even you know, better possibility of going to space with better quality image and continue this monitoring of the sun with better accuracies and so on. So enormous opportunities. This is again from our Kodaikana work. I was showing you butterfly diagram, which we generated from our digitized, you know, from photographic plates and films, we have digitized those images and then produced these science uh, results. But now this can be further improved and continued with our own space platform. So cross calibrate of 100 years of data, understand you know the total solar irradiance is the total solar emission which is coming. There is actually another very important element on the sun or solar physics is we did not have a direct measurement of magnetic field before 1970s. Now we know that it is the magnetic field which controls everything on the sun, but we do not have a direct observation of that. So how do we get back to the magnetic uh, you know, observational data? So these calcium and other, some of the images which I have shown, they provide a proxy. You don't have directly magnetic field, you don't have direct measurement of total radiation which was coming from the sun, but can you model these images which are digitized now and you know model it to get a total uh, solar energy output from the sun so this is what we are going to do but for that you need validation you need create the machine so machine will now work on the data which we collect from aditya or similar missions and then after we have some data and the proper calibrations and all that we go back to the history and say how really sun was behaving in the last 100 years. So there are lots of scope, you know, 
the data which were sort of dumped and left. Thankfully, it was all stored in a good order. And since we have digitized them, we are in good shape because once it is digitized, you know, it will stay there. So, um, so just one uh, result also from Helios. Helios is the one of the X-ray uh, spectrometers, as I said. These are not in you know no scientific publication yet because these are uh, first light pre-commissioning data. Since some of us have access, I'm just uh, showing you uh, to share our excitement. What is plotted here, the, uh, the green ones are, uh, the bluish green ones are from our own uh, Helios instrument. The red ones are from NASA uh, satellite data called GOES. So what you see is the correlation, the timings, are, all that is uh, pretty nice. It confirms uh, what NASA's uh, missions are seen. In addition, I would say we have better probably time cadence because here you see even some more perturbations here because we have better time resolutions. Whereas the GO satellite sees it is a smooth curve because they don't have that many frames. We have better time resolution. So we are very, very helpful, you know, uh, for flare. Again, ideal again, uh, aim is to predict the flares. You study the flare behavior, why there is a flare on the sun, where it is coming from, that magnetic environment where it becomes unstable and then it is eventually given rise to flare. You have studied those magnetic environments. And then you want to predict the finally the players. So I think there are an enormous uh, scope. And uh, I mentioned about the coronagraph because that's the instrument to be very involved for. I mean, I was involved for more than a decade. We have uh, this artificial, uh, you know, eclipse created, and we are going to look at this uh, area. We're going to work the CMEs. So the CMEs are these structures, but then we need automation. Incidentally, on Aditya L1 mission, see, since we are going so far, one major challenge is the telemetry. We don't see the satellite all the time. So we can't download all the data. And nowadays, the cameras, your mobile phone also, you all often experience this problem, your disk is full. And you sort of, you know, upload it into some drive, sync it, and then again start collecting. So, but your sync has to be accessible. If you are not have internet, you can't sync your data, right? So you have to be very judicious what you want to observe, what you want to copy, record it. So that automation is also we have enabled in the coronagraph machine. Automatically, it's like a motion sensor. We are talking about detecting any movements, right? So this is transient. So suppose you know nowadays the CCTV cameras they don't record all the images. They only record the images when there is a movement. If somebody, so what they do is they compare subsequent images and then they see that there is a change and then you record it. Basically, same principle, but of course, it's a little more sophisticated and some more uh, mathematical operations we are doing. And in that, we are trying to capture this series on board, on board in the FPGA, uh, you know, uh, coding. This will detect them. So that's how. We don't miss any CMEs. Otherwise, you know, we have to take many images. We can't afford to take that many images because on board we only have 512 GB. And that seven instruments, each instrument has multiple cameras they are going to record. So it's always a fight to know who will get more time and so on. So optimization is required for automation. So automation is the key. And uh, that's how we are looking for the future. We have this support cell. For Aditya user community, uh, which is hosted at AIMS uh, Nainital, with uh, collaborations with uh, with uh, ISRO, of course, we are conducting many workshops across uh, India. Those who are interested in, you know, sort of using the data and all that, you see, the people who build the instruments, they are familiar with how to analyze the data. Uh, even if we make the data public, you know, people will not be able to use it unless you know the data analysis techniques and what are the corrections to be done with the, every data will have, you know, some corrections necessary and some processing, uh, you know, skills are necessary for that. So for that, uh, we have this Aditya support cell. I see my support cell, uh, you know, colleagues are getting into <laughs> the, uh, the room now. Uh, they just arrived from uh, uh, the Rita with the second uh, car. So this particular school, which we are going to have from tomorrow, 
uh, is also part of uh, training uh, people for uh, solar physics and uh, and how one can get engaged with uh, Aditya. So feel free to contact us. This is the QR code. If you like, you can scan it and uh, go through our website. The next uh, support school uh, support cell workshop is going to be in Kolkata between 6th and 8th of uh, February. Uh, so if you are interested, you can contact them. Uh, and there will be online applications and uh, master students. So this is a uh, this is a shorter training school for master students primarily. And uh, some of the engineering students also, if they are particularly interested, uh, you can apply. And uh, we'll be happy to have you on board. So I think there is an enormous opportunity. Uh, it's a lifetime experience for some of us. I was fortunate enough to uh, see it uh, with our own eyes. Uh, this is the project director of the mission, uh, Nigar Saji. Uh, yeah, Shomo probably you, some of you know now. Shomo is the vice chancellor of Ashoka University, which is your neighbor now. Uh, he has been involved with the suit instrument uh, for, for, for quite some time. I did not talk about our observatory. I come from a very beautiful place. Um, this is a picture taken from our campus at Bevasan near Mukteshwar. And you could see these uh, peaks. So you are most welcome to visit us anytime you like. You can again contact me or my uh, colleagues here uh, how to uh, do that. Uh, it's a wonderful place. Again, I did not talk about uh, the amount of data we generate in these big telescopes and facilities at Aries. There are a lot of AI applications. Uh, incidentally, we have a liquid mirror telescope which is generating huge amount of data. There are students who are working with this, uh, you know, AI ML uh, applications. We are actually signing an MOU tomorrow morning, hopefully. We are going to have a MTEC PhD program on uh, you know AML applications for astronomy in specific with NIT Delhi uh, the students will be enrolled through get uh, exams scores at NIT Delhi first year you have to stay in NIT then uh, you will come to uh, Aries and do your masters and then subsequently if you want to continue uh, uh, for a PhD it's an integrated program so ideally we would like 100 percent students to continue unless you, you know, do very bad in your exams. Uh, and this will give you a very, very new avenue. I can tell you that, uh, for particularly for engineering students and all that, there are industry also is looking for such expertise. Because astronomy provides you certain, you know, new uh, challenges in terms of the data type classification. Suppose, you know, you just want to classify a number of galaxies. You want to just, you know, detect a dead satellite, we call it space debris. You know, the space is filled with these debris. ISRO is so much of interest to now know where the space debris are, because they are also a big hazard for new uh, launch and new satellite missions and all that. So there are n number of applications. In fact, um, some of our my PhD students have been offered by companies in Bangalore uh, for a hefty thing, but somehow my PhD students still prefer to go abroad for postdocs, but they have hired one of our master students <laughs> who did his project from Aizal Pune. And now I don't know what salary he is getting, but Digantara is a, a company which is uh, open and they are working on these, you know, space debris things and also the satellite things, the drags. Because at the end of the day, you know, private companies still do not know how to solve the differential equation so, <laughs> and with the extra bit of terms <laughs> I think the life is even more complicated than this you know uh, uh, there are no ready-made tools to give you this you have to always improve your equations to get a better understanding for that physicist and necessary mathematicians are necessary so astronomy provides that background and that training so I think this is a new era which uh, you know industry has realized in India of course, in astronomy, the research. If you go to uh, uh, go to uh, England or Europe, you will see that 80, 90 percent students are absorbed in industry, either in banks or in gas company or you name it, in a number of places. So, astronomy is a good avenue for doing uh, PhD, and uh, you know all these image processing techniques and all that are quite useful. 
or uh, data uh, handling as well, of any nature, even stock. So stock companies also look for astronomy uh, students. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, I am ready for questions. Yeah, please feel free to ask questions. If you don't ask questions, I will feel that you know my time is wasted. <laughs> Any question from audience? Yeah, don't feel shy. Just, yeah, just ask. <laughs> yeah, because this is very informal. It's not really. So I think it is not fair to say Aditya is better than so. I will never say that and I hope I have not said it. <laughs> uh, what happens in any space mission is, you know, some of the technology which you can implement is, uh, is a reflection of the technological status at that time or even 10 years back. Because new, very new technologies is very risky for going to space. It has to be a proven thing. So Soho has also a spectrograph, images, but the capabilities of uh, those instruments have certain limitations. So whatever Soho could not achieve, we try to, you know, look at that. So in science, what happens is, you know, you're, you, uh, you look at certain development and then try to find out what is still not understand. Is it missing? So main thing is still, what is missing? What is not allowing us to go for, for a better understanding of, you know, I did not talk about, you know, the specific problems in the, in the solar physics. Why the corona is so hot? This is a problem which I started in, you know, for my first PhD uh, project was on corona heating, 1990. We do understand a lot of things about corona heating, but still it is not a complete. So why it is not complete? There are certain observations which are still not there. So with the new instrumentation, with the better, I mean, when you think about your mobile cameras, what was the state 10 years back and what, what you have today? Technology has changed. So with those modern technology, you make modern instruments and then you have little more, you know, you see, I'm sure in the night you could not take those pictures what you take in your mobile phone now, right? Night means what? It's, it's a very dark, very few photons. So the capabilities of these cameras, uh, or many such instruments, I'm just giving you one example, has improved dramatically. So that way we expect that Aditya will have certain abilities which Soho could not see. But I will never say that Aditya is a better mission than Soho, because Soho had 13 instruments. With, and when Soho was launched, you know, you have to think about that time also, right? 95 it was launched, so they could implement technology which was available even before 90s. So uh, that way it has revolutionized actually our field. Uh, uh, but we are trying to, to improve or add on to our understanding. Yeah. Um, hello sir. Uh, sir, uh, I have one particular question. Like, uh, with Alipte and when we are studying the sun. So, do we have something similar for any other stuff? I mean, the I, if I understand it correctly, the primary reason for studying the sun is the, it impacts the earth very much and it's the nearest thing. Yeah, you are absolutely right. So, for space missions from India, we have a, a mission called AstroSat, which is again a multi wavelength observatory, which is uh, already completed the operation of seven years. It was launched uh, for the nominal period of five years. Yeah, I mean, before you ask anybody questions, so, so for Aditya, the nominal life is five years, but we expect we'll be there 10 years or even more. Because so was launched in 95, it is still there. So that's the one another advantage of going to Lagrange one point. So if you want real vantage points in terms of even Lagrange one, L2 is, you know, very good for astronomy. So the James Webb telescope, which is the newly, you know, the most modern telescope from NASA, is actually L2 because it gets the you know shadow of the earth also because it is looking at infrared and it is now first time with the six meter class telescope it's going to much much deeper 
in the universe, so to say. So uh, for astronomy missions, there are uh, astrocytes is in a small, I mean, sort of lower orbit. It's not a small satellite. It's a uh, full fledged observatory with five payloads: the X-ray and you know uh, UV and so on. Uh, it, um, from India, there are three, four different astronomy missions are under you know discussions. Nothing yet formally approved, but of course uh, you know there are a number of astronomy uh, satellite missions looking at multi and X-rays and, and so on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there is one here. Yeah. Uh, sir, I'm from the other land. Uh, so, sir, you saw some pattern. There's a butterfly pattern over there. So, could we understand this pattern through the toroidal or colloidal flow of the zone? So, can you explain? Yeah. So, uh, what uh, our colleague from PRL is Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad. I guess he's one of the uh, participants from the school. What he's asking is, do we understand uh, the sort of source of this pattern? And he already given half the answer. Uh, so sun actually rotates, uh, you know, around its own axis, but it doesn't rotate uniformly. It rotates actually differentially. It's actually pretty funny. The equator rotates faster than the pole, and it's not a solid object also. And when I give uh, this uh, example, think about this, you know, I'm a big fat man now. If uh, the tummy is rotated, uh, you know, on speed, and the head is rotated at other speed, what is the kind of stress which is going to be built in your body? That's what sun experiences inside. So there are stretch, uh, you know, stress, uh, stretching of uh, uh, things. As so, what we understand is these magnetic uh, tubes, which is probably formed in the base of the convection zone. So sun also has a different layers inside. So 30% inside it is uh, it is convective and at the base of the convection zone probably these flux tubes are generated and these flux tubes are normally lighter than the surrounding. It's a similar like an upper tube or a, or a balloon you see as, as it floats. So as it comes up it experiences two forces. One is the convection and differential rotation and on the top of that there is this stretching and you know so that dictates where these magnetic tubes will come. So depending on the phase of the solar cycle and so on, we see that these tubes, because there is a time scale also for this field to be generated at the base of the convection zone and to come to the surface. And as it comes to the surface, this sunspot pair, one uh, leading polarity goes towards the equator. That gives rise to this, uh, you know, this kind of branches, and the receding polarity, which is weaker, that goes to the pole. So the solar, you know, both the hemisphere, there is a polar field also, and that polar field also has certain polarity. So this weaker field, when it goes to the pole, it interacts with the existing polar field, and then it actually cancels the polar field. And polarity reversal also happens. I did not talk about it at all. Uh, I already talked about sunspot number, which varies with the 11 year cycle. But every 11 year, this polarity of the sun also flips. The magnetic polarity of the northern hemisphere flips. So, in principle, the, the solar cycle is 22 years. Because again, after 11 years, this uh, you know flip will happen, and the hemisphere will have the same polarity as it was 22 years back. So all these happens because of the, uh, as you roughly said, we call it toroidal field because these uh, sunspots are toroidal in nature because this is like a torus when the magnetic tube comes out, and this tube is also undergoing some stretches and all that, and the bipolar field. So the entire hemisphere we call it polyoidal field. So the toroidal field gives rise to polyoidal field, and that polyoidal field is taken back to the base of convection zone through another conveyor bolt belt inside the sun. So we call it meridional circulation. So, so it is a cyclic process. So one is feeding. So that the speed at which these movements happen dictates the periodicity, 11 years. And where it will come also is somewhat dictated by 
the nature of the differential rotation and uh, also how much time it takes to come to the surface. If the, for many stars, which are very strong fields, much stronger than the sun, there the sun, the star spots appear straight into the poles because they pop up, uh, you know, much faster. So, uh, people study different magnetic stars and this pattern, uh, their their uh, equator work migration, the pole work migration and the cycle length, strength, all these things depend on all these parameters, how fast the star <laughs> is rotating, how much convectivity is, how old is the star. So all these things, uh, you know, have a uh, lot of things, uh, you know, uh, bearing on this. Yeah. It's a bit of a detailed question and I, since I work on this field and there is an expert, uh, Gopal Singh. <laughs> he did his PhD on this, so you can you can discuss with Gopal also for further clarity of that. More questions? I know the organizers are ready to close the session. <laughs> <laughs> so, people are tired. Oh, there is one question from Young Delhi. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Myself, Nisha from Banaras University, Banaras. And uh, I've been our MSc final year student with a specialization in space and solar physics. So I would like, uh, I would like to know how well Aditya L1 help us to understand the solar leading problem of it. Because as we know, we have many theories, the wave dissipation theory, the magnetic interaction theory, but still there's a lot of uh, to, uh, lot of what, what remains to understand with the solar leading problem. How would the payloads of Aditya help us? Good question. So she already knows a bit uh, uh, on the corona and the solar physics. So what she is, for the benefit of all, so what she is referring to that uh, why the corona is so hot, it's a normal thermodynamic process cannot explain because the photosphere at the surface of the sun is at 6000 Kelvin and uh, the corona is at a million Kelvin. So uh, normal thermodynamics cannot explain. So it has to be some non-thermodynamic processes which is involved. So there are two kind of uh, processes or mechanisms which is now invoked to explain this. One is called the reconnection. Like you know, you have lots of these magnetic uh, field lines, and these magnetic topologies will interact with each other, and then this magnetic energy will be converted into heat and kinetic energy and so on, which essentially gives rise to the spares. And the other theory is that you have lots of these different types of waves which are generated at different layers of the atmosphere of the sun. And they, they carry amount of energy and they get dissipate, uh, you know, by damping of these waves. Like, you know, your sound wave can damp and create, you know, uh, shocks and so on. Now, the question is, we know that these things happen. But where it happens in the sun and how much it happens is not properly quantified. And there are different types of waves. There could be, you know, low frequency wave, there could be high frequency wave. There could be magnetic type waves, there could be non-magnetic type waves. So we have all observations which are showing the presence of these waves. But if you put all, all the energy together, we are still not able to comprehend the full energy budget. So that means that we are not probably observing enough to account for all different types. For example, for to detect high frequency waves, you need very high cadence observation. That means every, you know, every second at least you should have the observation. But our imaging capabilities from space is for 5 seconds or 10 seconds. If you have a 10 second image, you cannot detect something which is varying in 1 second, right? So that means you have to have an observation which is millisecond of that order. So now with time, we are getting these capabilities of doing a very you know, high cadence observations to detect the high you know, frequency waves, for example. And if you have lots of data and taken at different times, we are able to say detect small flares, medium flares, big flares, very big flares, then we can, you know, add them up and probably get all the energy. Because now this competing theory is, they say, some people say, oh, flares don't happen all the time. Because there, there are sometimes, you know, there is no sunspots in the you know, you cannot have big flares when you do not have a sunspot, right? Then it is shown that it is not the big flares which is so important. If you have thousands of small guys, you add them up, that is equivalent to a one big guy, right? So that, that means you have to detect these small flares also. 
So with these, you know, uh, instrument like Solex, we are going to even lower energy as compared to what is available. The uh, available uh, excess spectrometers has lower cutoff at 3 keV. We are going up to 1, 1 keV. So that means we'll, we are expecting to detect many more small guys. So when we have all these, you know, different additional observations, probably we will be able to get the total energy budget and say, oh, coronal heating is there. Otherwise, you know, always some guy will say, oh, you have this wave, but that's not enough energy to hit. So that's what the expectation from Aditya is. Combination of coronagraph observation, near UV observation, HC observation will give you this. If you just look at one, you'll not be able to, you know, get all the features also detected. Okay, before the organizers uh, say their last words, uh, I'm almost here for the next five days. Uh, the school is there and I'll be in and out, either inside or sometimes, you know, attending meetings in the next room uh, uh, virtually. <laughs> so feel free to, you know, approach me or my colleagues from uh, from Aries and other, other locations also. So please make this, uh, you know, school as a more interactive uh, thing. It's just not the regular classes, uh, which is uh, which is important. It is it is the outside, uh, you know, time is more precise. We have in conferences we always enjoy the coffee talks and the you know conference dinner discussions. We get new ideas during that time apart from the you know uh, the main talk. Sorry, I'm hitting the projector. Sorry. Yeah, all yours. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. It was so <laughs> Thank you, sir. It was so interesting to know about all the scientific knowledge on solar physics. As we wrap up today's program, let's reflect on the valuable insights shared. We are thankful to Dr. B. S. Pandey and Dr. Preeti Verma for organizing the event. We thank Professor Ajay K. Sharma, Director, NIT Delhi, for his support and encouragement. We appreciate each one of you for your active participation. Remember, the journey doesn't end here. Apply what you have learned and let's continue to grow together. Thank you. And until the next time, stay inspired. Now I request everyone to join us for the tea. Thank you, everyone. Excuse me, guys. Don't leave. Please assemble here for a group photo. Everyone. Yeah, yeah. Don't leave. Don't leave. Excuse me.